The following program presents principles designed to promote good health and is not intended to take the place of personalized professional care. The opinions and ideas expressed are those of the speaker. Viewers are encouraged to draw their own conclusions about the information presented. Hello and welcome to Health for a Lifetime. I'm your host Don McIntosh. We're glad you've joined us today. We're going to be talking about women's health issues today and joining us to talk about this vital subject is Dr. Eric Shaddle. Welcome Dr. Shaddle. Thank you. We're glad that you're with us. Now you know you've been in obstetrics and gynecology I guess is the subspecialty that you're in that's for correct. about what 15, 16 years now. Yes that's right. And so you've seen a lot of things that deal with women's health issues, but today we're going to be talking about menopause. Yes. And is this a big problem? A lot of people coming to see you about this? Actually, it's probably one of the uh, bigger problems that uh, I'm consulted for. Uh, of course, all women, if they live long enough, go through the menopause. And so it's uh, something that is a big issue for most women. What exactly is menopause and what are the stages involved in that? Well, there are at least two stages uh, that I'd want to talk about today. One is the perimenopause. That's the first stage. And that's the time when the ovaries function is decreasing. It's uh, making less and less estrogen. And there can be a, a variety of symptoms associated with that. And then there's the menopause itself, which is when the ovary stops functioning altogether. So really, that's what the word menopause means, a pausing or cessation maybe of, of the menses. Of that's... The the period. Yeah, that's right. And I think you have a, a graphic about this that kind of gives us the details of it. Yeah, it, is. it talks a little bit about the definitions. The perimenopause, actually, uh, the average age is uh, 47, though it can last for several years. I mm -hmm. think the graphic talks about uh, that it can last for two to six years. Uh, and uh, it may not occur at all, though. Sometimes, just stop, right? sometimes uh, the ovaries just uh, stop functioning. So you have regular periods right up into the menopause. And then the average age for menopause is age uh, 51, and 90% of women uh, actually go through the menopause by age 55. So it's rare to go beyond the age of 55. So then in making the diagnosis, I mean, the age factors into it and other different things. What kind of things do you say, hey, yeah, this is, this is what's happening? Well, the, the most common way to make the diagnosis of the menopause is simply by history. Mm -hmm. The clinical history, uh, when a woman comes in and says, well, I haven't had a period for six months or for a year, then I know uh, that she is menopausal. Her ovaries aren't functioning. Mm -hmm. uh, but we can confirm that with laboratory tests. There's uh, laboratory tests, something called FSH, that's follicle stimulating hormone. That's a hormone made in the pituitary gland that controls ovarian function and it uh, is secreted by the pituitary gland to tell the ovary to... What to do and when. That's right. Mm -hmm. and, and when the ovary stops functioning, the pituitary gland goes into overdrive and keeps reminding the ovary to function uh, even though it won't do it at that time because it's physiologically time for the ovary to stop functioning. So it goes up, in other words, you, it, it, but there's no response from the ovary. That's right. And you can see that in the blood, and you say, okay, this is what's happening, and so you're at that stage, and it's okay. That's right, it's okay. <laughs> but interestingly enough, that FSH does stay high throughout a woman's life. So there's something in the pituitary gland that that keeps secreting that FSH. Even though it doesn't do anything. Even though it doesn't do anything. And so uh, some of us in the field believe that FSH probably has another function mm -hmm. because uh, I don't think that God would have made our pituitary glands or a woman's pituitary gland in a way that wouldn't downregulate once it realized the ovary was uh, not functioning. 
I mean, you're just trying to figure out what that is. You don't yeah, know that's exactly right. Not okay. exactly. Now, you have down here something about perimenopausal transition. That sounds like a big word, but I suppose it's uh, talking about the transition from having regular periods to none at all. Is that what that means? Yeah, exactly. And that can be uh, a, a difficult time for many women. And in fact, menopausal symptoms that most women talk about are, are actually in this transition time, this perimenopausal transition that can last for years and can have a variety of symptoms. The bleeding, uh, their vaginal bleeding can be very unpredictable. It can be heavy or they may miss periods and it could be very light. Uh, and it all has to do with the fluctuation in estrogen levels that's occurring in the ovary. So it really has uh, some uh, things that affect how someone feels emotionally and this and that. I mean, yeah. uh, I've never been through that myself and neither has my wife, you know, we're not quite to that stage. Um, and so I, you know, these kind of things though, I certainly have heard about yes. and we certainly know about. So what are, are some real symptoms then of the uh, perimenopausal time? Well, we have symptoms of the uh, perimenopause, which... Uh, like up here in the graphic, like hot flashes? That's right, hot flashes, the irregular periods that I talked about. That mm -hmm. can be periods that um, uh, you, you may, a woman may miss periods or she may have frequent periods. It can include mood swings, fluid retention, uh, which can be one of the symptoms of fluid retention, maybe bloating, mm -hmm. uh, memory problems, headaches. Those are some of the uh, perimenopausal symptoms that we see. And so we when, when people come in and they have that, what do you, uh, how do you help them, for instance, with the, can you help someone with hot flashes? Yes, we can help people with, uh, women with hot flashes. Yeah, I guess you're going to talk about and that a little we'll, bit later. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And with all these things, there are things that you do that help them. Right. And uh, depending on the mm -hmm. level. And there are specific symptoms. Okay. And we can... We can either look at it as treating each individual symptom or try to treat the underlying uh, cause, which many of those may be an estrogen deficiency, uh, but that's, that's another issue that I, maybe we can get talk to about a little bit later. And uh, really, you know, let's say we're, we're talking in a Western medical model. That's right. I mean, we're talking in America and we're talking, uh, you know, Western medicine but maybe later on sometime where we can talk about what you would do if these things started happening in your country or you're in a place where you, you can't go mm -hmm. see someone like you. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Um, what are the symptoms then? Uh, that's perimenopause, so the hot flashes and all those things we talked about. What are the symptoms then in menopause? Well, the first symptom I would uh, describe would be vaginal dryness. There can also be a symptom such as skin changes, urinary problems, uh, decreased sexual drive or libido uh, is described as well as some of the symptoms of menopause. So skin changes, what do you mean by that? Uh, it can be skin dryness, uh, wrinkling can occur more and more. Is this because there's not as much estrogen? It is thought that uh, estrogen certainly plays a role in that because it uh, increases the elasticity mm -hmm. of the tissue and so as estrogen is withdrawn there's less elasticity in the uh, drier skin and more wrinkling. So these, these kind of things though can really cause, what would you say, maybe uh, disruptions or fluctuations in someone's relationships too. I mean, these are very intimate things we're talking about. That's right. And uh, do you find yourself talking not just to the lady, but also the man sometimes in, uh, in these situations? For menopausal symptoms, actually, I, I don't have husbands coming in with their wives very often. Uh, that occurs in other situations in my practice, for example, infertility issues, uh, couples that uh, are wanting to get pregnant. But generally, uh, women in the menopause, of, co of course, are mature and they um, kind of have their own ideas on what uh, their issues are and they generally don't bring their husbands with them. But you're right, it does impact the couple. Uh, it can impact them greatly. So how should a man be reacting at this particular time? I mean, I know that's a really open question, but are there some pointers that you sometimes, you would say, I know this is not on our right. list of things, but how, how should they react? Just sensitively and... Absolutely. Uh, I think they... 
A man needs to understand that there are changes that occur in a woman that are physiologic. There are changes that occur because she's going through hormonal fluctuations and that has real effects on her body. Mm -hmm. It's not imaginary. She's not imagining these things and, and uh, mood swings could occur that I uh, that we haven't listed uh, mm -hmm. on graphics, but mood swings certainly can be one of the things that women have in the transition or even in the menopause. So then what is the timing here of the menopause? Uh, we've talked about how it, it comes, there's the perimenopause, which is physiologically, but what more about timing do we need to know about? Well, timing is determined, it seems to be predetermined in, in many ways uh, by a programmed loss of the ovarian follicles. Those follicles are uh, the eggs that a woman has. She has uh, a certain number of eggs in her ovaries and several of them are, are maturing each month due to hormonal stimulation. Mm -hmm. And so several of them are used up every single uh, cycle. And at a given time, they're, they're all used up, uh, more or less, and that's when we see the menopause occurring. And as I said before, the average age is 51. 55 is considered the upper age of, uh, or the upper limits of normal uh, of an age to if go you through smoke, the menopause. Does that make a difference? Smoking does uh, cause the menopause to come earlier. Mm -hmm. Also, if a woman's never had children, she could probably expect to go through the menopause earlier. And maybe that's because for those nine months of those pregnancy, there's no eggs being, uh, being used each month. I just was gonna ask that, so that, that explains it. So let's come back to this issue of hot flashes. What exactly is happening physiologically there? What's going on? Well, hot flashes actually occur in about 75% of menopausal women. Mm -hmm. It's a very common symptom and we think it's due primarily to estrogen deficiency, but there can be a variety of causes for uh, hot flashes. The first type of causes would be physiologic, such as the menopause, mm -hmm. but uh, other physiologic causes would be hot drinks or emotional distress, so men can have hot flashes too. I bet our guests, <laughs> our viewers didn't uh, realize that actually men can have hot flashes. So when you made hot drinks, something you drink that makes you feel hot? Mm -hmm. That's know. right. It can actually cause a response that would cause a flushing, especially in the okay. uh, chest and the uh, face and the head. So I guess if you take some niacin too, some people tell That's me that, right. that'll Ni make you have a serious hot flash. <laughs> That's exactly right, a uh, serious hot flash. So what about, you, say you have down here also some drugs that can make you feel like you have a hot flash type symptom. Yes, uh, drugs and under drugs I would include not only medications but drugs such as alcohol, especially in Asian women, alcohol has a, a big effect. Uh, there's other medications that uh, may have an effect as well. Um, that cause you to just feel like you're flushed and flashed and that's right. everything like that. So you kind of have to work through those. It could be menopause, but it could be something else. There could taking. be medications that we'd have to look at, or it could be actually diseases. One of the most common would be carcinoid, carcinoid syndrome. It can be a serious. Uh, what is carcinoid syndrome? It's, it's actually a, a syndrome where the body starts making too much of a certain hormone okay. and, and it can cause dramatic effects on the heart, blood pressure, and other effects. Hmm. So hot flashes then can be from something you drink, some medication or drugs you're taking, and then also various diseases. So if you're having a hot flash, basically the bottom line is, and you don't know what's causing it, or you have any suspicion, they really should see somebody like you. That's right. Is that right? Yeah. Because that can be a real sign of something. It can be a sign of something, but, but we learned something in medical school. If you hear hoofbeats, you generally think of horses, not zebras. And so, <laughs> okay. and so we would look for the most common. So you have a woman who's 51, she's, she had her last period eight months ago, that's and she's having it. hot flashes, then we know that that's most likely uh, menopausal symptoms. It's due to an estrogen deficiency and something that we need to look but at. But if you're having hot flashes and you're 17, that's right. or if you're having hot flashes yes. and, you're ha and you already went through menopause and now you're 70 and you're having those again, that's a different thing. That maybe. may be a different thing altogether. Okay, so that's something we need. When the light goes off in the car, 
you know, that dummy light that says, yeah. hey, you better get it checked out. That's right. This is that kind of thing. Okay. That's right. Anything else about hot flashes? We don't want to miss anything on that. Well, they are caused by, we think, a th uh, what we would call a thermoregulatory dysfunction in the brain. Okay. The brain uh, actually controls the uh, our temperature. And mm -hmm. when things, uh, th there's something there that can reset that, and it is sensitive to estrogen. That's why we do think that estrogen is a major part in that. Do they ever get over hot flashes? Do, will they leave? I mean, people maybe just starting that and say, man, I can't do this anymore. Um, That's right. They yeah. get over them? Generally. Uh, hot flashes are self-limited, but that self-limiting factor can be for five to six years. So it's pretty hard to tell a woman who's just been, uh, just started hot flashes in the last few months to tell her, don't worry about it, they'll go away in six years. <laughs> because she may, so, have, she right. may have several a day, okay. and they can be very disturbing to her. They may be embarrassing because she may feel like she's red, even though she's not, and she feels like everybody Everybody's can see her, and, yeah. and it can be uh, very distracting to her. We're talking with Dr. Eric Shaddle. He uh, is a specialist in women's health issues, obstetrics and gynecology. We've been talking about some very practical issues today. When we come back, we're going to be talking about more things that occur with the body uh, at or after the time of menopause. We hope that you join us when we come back. Have you found yourself wishing that you could shed a few pounds? Have you been on a diet for most of your life, but not found anything that will really keep the weight off? If you've answered yes to any of these questions, then we have a solution for you that works. Dr. Hans Deal and Dr. Eileen Lettington have written a marvelous booklet called Reversing Obesity Naturally, and we'd like to send it to you free of charge. Here's a medically sound approach successfully used by thousands who were able to eat more and lose weight permanently without feeling guilty or hungry through lifestyle medicine. Dr. Deal and Dr. Ludington have been featured on 3ABN, and in this booklet, they present a sensible approach to eating, nutrition, and lifestyle changes that can help you prevent heart disease, diabetes, and even cancer. Call or write today for your free copy of Reversing Obesity Naturally, and you could be on your way to a healthier, happier you. It's absolutely free of charge, so call or write today. Welcome back. We've been talking about women's health issues. We've been talking about menopause, really, an exciting uh, subject or a, a subject that a lot of people deal with. We've talked about hot flashes. We've talked about when we know we're having that, what we should be looking for. We've talked about the fact that a hot flash at the right time in life is really, uh, what would you say, not no big deal, but it tells us that menopause is occurring. But if it's happening at other times, we may want to look and see what is really occurring. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit about more uh, about the health issues that occur during or after menopause uh, with ladies that maybe they don't occur before that time. And one of the things we have down here are about urinary problems. Talk with us a little bit about that. Well, several urinary problems that uh, seem to be directly related to an estrogen deficiency. The base of the bladder and vaginal tissue have a high number of estrogen receptors and when estrogen is not binding to those receptors then we lose elasticity not only in the vagina but in the base of the bladder as well. It also, those estrogen receptors increase the amount of glycogen in those cells. Mm -hmm. it, it, it helps maintain vaginal pH as well as the pH in the, uh, in the bladder and thus it can decrease the number of bladder infections and it can decrease uh, the what we'd call vaginal prolapse or uh, symptoms of, of vaginal uh, relaxation. Okay, so after menopause these things then start to occur. You have problems with with uh, all of those things, maybe urination, maybe leakage, all those different kind of things. That's right. The, the leakage, uh, there's two main types of urinary leakage that we find. One is what we call stress incontinence, and that's uh, due to not only that, last of uh, that loss of elasticity, but it's also due to the fact that 
they, there's an angle between where the bladder and the urethra join. Mm -hmm. And that angle needs to be at the, pr at the proper angle or else Things there can be, when you cough or any increase in intra-abdominal pressure will cause a loss of urine. So when the elasticity changes, then the that the angle changes. Angel, angle changes and then things that wouldn't have caused that before start to cause that. That's right. The, the, the other type of uh, urinary leakage we call incontinence, urinary incontinence, would be what we call urge incontinence. And so the bladder as it gets full, but maybe not as full as it should be to be able to cause those symptoms, the woman then has to get to the bathroom and go right away, otherwise the urine comes out. Okay, and th these are good things to know because I mean, look, if you're going through this and you've never been able to talk to someone like you, <laughs> then you can, uh, you can understand what's happening. Um, you know, are there any other significant medical problems that occur after or, you know, I guess it would be after menopause. Yes, there's three main concerns, uh, serious medical concerns that we have. One is osteoporosis, the other is heart disease, and the third is breast cancer. Well, let's talk about those a little bit. What about the osteoporosis? Why is this a problem? It is a huge problem in this country. Uh, it involves uh, over a million women and it's, um, it is a problem where up to one to five percent of bone is lost each year. Wow, that's a lot of bone. That's a lot of bone and, uh, and women uh, seem to be losing more bone after the menopause or during uh, those years after age 50 or so. So we have to look at that and that's something that seems to accelerate then after our period stop or after menopause. Then what, what about heart disease? Heart disease also increases dramatically after a woman goes through menopause. Before that time, her incidence of, of uh, heart disease is quite a bit less than men. And then after menopause, her incidence starts g rising rapidly to uh, get to about the same level as men. So there's some kind of protective element that seems to go away. That seems to go away. At least that's one of the theories that we have. It's, it's easy for us to try to draw that conclusion based upon this menopausal time frame. And then probably one of the things that causes the most fear in women is when you say breast cancer. That's right. And that happens, that seems to occur more after menopause? Breast cancer incidence does rise with age, whether it's due to something in the menopause or, rather, or whether it's just an age-related phenomenon. And one could say the same with the others that we just talked about, osteoporosis and heart disease as well, because that may be more of an age-related issue, though we see a big rise at the menopause, making us wonder if there's a, a specific cause related to the menopause. Yeah, I know that this <coughs> subject of estrogen and heart disease is pretty controversial, and maybe we'll talk about that more some other time, but there seems to be a real focusing in on the things that are secreted by the body and before menopause and then afterwards saying, hey, this must have something to do with it. Yes. Okay, um, let me ask you this question. I know you're a Christian physician and you, uh, you know, practice not only as a, as a physician, but also you've done some pastoring yes, <laughs> as right. well. Um, it, and this is kind of a philosophical question too, I'd imagine. Is menopause a natural thing? Did God create us to be that way or women to have menopause? Is it a natural state? I believe that menopause is a natural state. And we know that uh, in biblical times, early on, we know Sarah must have had uh, concerns about menopause and not being able to have children. The child of promise. That's right. So, so it's not something that is new. It's not something that we've seen just in the last hundred years. I think it's something that's, that's been there. Whether it came as a result of sin uh, uh, is certainly open to debate, but it is something that every woman goes through. If It's hard for me to define something as a disease if 100% of the population has it. We generally think of a disease as something that is different, something that uh, it has a specific cause. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And when you have menopause, this is 
This is a condition that every woman goes through. So really the way you relate to patients then is not a disease model that says this is something wrong with you, we're going to fix it, but this is something This is something that's natural. This is something that every woman goes through and we need to individualize as to what type of treatment uh, would be appropriate, what is the best for a particular woman based upon her own specific symptoms as well as her own lifestyle patterns what type of diet is she eating, what type of exercise, what kind of stress is in her life, and what has been in her life for the 50 years or so before she goes through the menopause. So in other words, looking at a natural state then would cause them to actually look at all these things throughout their life rather than, okay, we can do whatever we want until we get to that state. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. I think that what we find is that in Western society, in the United States in particular, we find that uh, we live almost unnaturally, I would say. We, we eat foods that stimulate, we keep hours that stimulate, we have lifestyles that stimulate, we have a lack of, a lack of exercise, and all of these things create tremendous stress on the body that when a woman then goes through the menopause, she starts feeling things at being out of balance, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, it, it starts clicking for her. There is something not right here. There's something out of balance. And so she comes to me to say, help me get back into balance. And what she's really looking for is a pill. And so it's very easy to give her estrogen, for example, because what we've thought is that she's estrogen deficient. So it makes some sense to give her estrogen. Mm -hmm. But maybe that's not why she's out of balance. Maybe she's out of balance because of her diet. Maybe she's out of balance because there's stress in her life. And I think we need to look at those underlying causes that are impacting her at the menopause. As a Christian physician, I mean, all of these stages of transition, do you find that at these times people are very open spiritually? Do you have these kind of conversations ever with them or do you see that as an opportunity for us to maybe reevaluate our lives in that way? Absolutely, anytime we have big changes we go into transition, it, uh, w w we're open to other changes because we're searching. I, I think health is related to spiritual things in that we are um, only to be in, well, to be healthy, we need the spiritual side of life. I really think that that is important. I mean, what a time of transition and what an opportunity you have. We're glad that uh, men like you are there to be able to help us and help the ladies with these different problems. You've been looking at Health for a Lifetime. We hope that you've enjoyed this program and we hope that it will help you in the different transitions in your life. We hope that as a result, you'll have health that lasts for a lifetime.